Good evening and welcome to this month's webinar, Rescue, Rehabilitation and Release, an Inside Look. My name is Hannah McDougall. I'm the Director of Communications here at Pelican Harbor and I'm going to be telling you guys a little bit more about what we do here, the different animals that we get in, and their treatments. So here at Pelican Harbor, it is our mission to rescue, rehabilitate, and release sick, injured, or orphaned brown pelicans, seabirds, and other native wildlife, and to preserve and protect these species through educational and scientific means. So at our core, we are a wildlife hospital. However, we do lots of community education, such as these webinars, to be able to educate the community about who we are and what we're doing and the importance of conservation in our communities. We do not treat uh, non-native species. Unfortunately, uh, we are prohibited by law to um, treat or release any species that is not native to the animal kingdom of Florida. Um, so we provide different referrals um, and other external organizations to people if they ever bring in these animals. Um, but unfortunately, we are not, uh, we're not licensed to treat non-natives. So this is why our um, mission is it's only for native species. So why do we rehabilitate wildlife? Why are we here? Um, so the point of wildlife rehabilitation is to introduce or reintroduce productive individuals back to their natural environments. So what this means is that good enough is not good enough. In order to be a productive individual, these organisms are going to have to um, fend for themselves, they're going to have to evade predators, they're going to have to find food and hunt and mate. Um, so uh, if something's not 100%, um, it's not going to be able to be a viable productive individual out back in the wild. So this is always what we have to take into consideration while considering rehabilitation and release of these animals. Which leads us to another legal obligation that we have, which is to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So this law actually prohibits us from even attempting to treat certain injuries um, that would result in an animal being permanently non-releasable. So this is kind of a hard pill to swallow sometimes, um, but approximately 25% of the patients that we receive at the clinic must legally uh, be humanely euthanized. This is not our choice. Um, this is just unfortunately something that we have to do in order to maintain um, quality of life and uh, follow the law and make sure that we're treating these patients in the most humane manner possible. So now on to our initial intake. This is the process that all of our animals are going to go through um, once they are entered into the hospital. So there's three things that all patients get upon arrival, one of which is vitamin E. Um, this helps to prevent capture myopathy, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, second, they're all going to be dewormed. So you can see here this fish crow is getting an oral dewormer. Um, we also have injectable dewormers. It depends on the size of the species, the type of species that it is, um, and the dose of the medication. Uh, and then lastly, they're going to be getting fluids with a vitamin B complex. So the syringe there you can see is very yellow. The vitamin B is a pretty bright yellow. Uh, and what this does is this aids even further in hydration. It really allows that body to be able to quickly absorb those fluids um, and get that hydration quickly to the cells of the body. So I had briefly mentioned capture myopathy and uh, that being the reason why we administer vitamin E upon intake. So capture myopathy is a really important consideration as well uh, when dealing with wildlife. What this is and is, is essentially uh, a prolonged period of the fight or flight stress response in a wild animal. And if they are encountering these uh, stress hormones for an extended period of time, essentially the body just begins to break down its own muscle. Um, there's blood acidosis, cardiac function is decreased, um, and overall the body just starts to shut down. So this is something that we're incredibly aware of throughout the entire rehabilitation process. So in addition to giving the preventative vitamin E on intake, this is also why we try to have an incredibly hands-off approach so that other than weighing and cleaning and uh, performing treatments on these animals, we're completely hands-off. Um, they're unable to see us. We talk very quietly in the clinic. Um, they're always covered with towels because we really want them to have as little amount of interaction with us as possible so that those stress levels remain low. 
And that's why it's so important if you ever come across a wild animal that you are trying to rescue, um, that you place it in a dark, quiet box as quickly as possible, that you don't try to, you know, soothe it or pet it um, or interact with it in any way because you could end up doing a lot more harm than good at that point. So our next point in our intake examination is going to be looking at the patient's body condition. So birds are uh, scored on a scale of 1 to 5. Uh, it's called a keel score. So the keel is the uh, bone, sort of like their breastbone. Um, and in order to see their overall muscle composition, we're going to gently part the feathers there at that breastbone and take a look at how sharp their keel bone is. So being sharp means that there's just not lots of muscle on either side of that bone, so the bone is pretty protruding. Um, and then plump would be five, uh, and that's when there is an excess of, of muscle. Um, it's almost impossible to see that bone. And that's often what we're seeing in migrating birds or overall birds that are uh, in very good health but might have come in from head trauma or something that um, was kind of an immediate sickness rather than something that caused their body condition to slowly deteriorate over time. So here you can see a couple of examples of what a keel score of a 1 would be. So this is an emaciated bird. Uh, you can easily feel that keel bone between your fingertips. There's hardly any muscle there. Uh, reasonable in the middle, that's around a 3. This is usually what we see our wildlife patients coming in with. Um, unfortunately, there's not a, always an all-you-can-eat buffet out there. Um, so 3 is very normal. That's kind of around where We'd like to see our patients um, because if they're over on the right, like this plump bird, um, this bird was migrating. It was a migrating warbler, which is why it was uh, very chunky and plump. Um, but sometimes if an animal actually gets too plump in care, it could uh, hinder its ability to be released, especially hawks. Um, if a hawk is too heavy, it won't be able to, to fly properly because its um, weight disposition is a little off. So body condition is important both on intake, but also when determining if something's ready to be released. Um, so here we have our blood work and crop swab station. So upon intake, most of our patients will also be getting blood work taken. Uh, and then depending on the species, they're also going to be getting a crop swab. So what we're going to look for in blood work um, is their packed cell volume. So we take a small sample of blood, and put it in hematocrit tubes, use a centrifuge to then spin that down. And then we use this reader here to determine um, what amount of red blood cells they have. So what's the volume of the cells, packed cell volume. Um, and what we're looking here, looking for here is around 35 to 40 is a healthy number. Um, anything below 15 is also going to have a very poor prognosis. Um, it's just at that point, the body is so weak, um, even if it's given iron. Uh, so we will supplement with iron if there's low PCV values. Um, it just really depends on each diagnostic, um, like what the best course of action is. Um, so yes, we'll administer iron um, for anyone that has low PCV. And we also do crop swabs. We do this on species of um, raptors that eat doves, as well as doves. Um, doves are very um, susceptible to getting something called Trichomonas gallinae, which is uh, here on the left, you can see under the microscope, that's what it looks like. They're kind of like vibrating uh, little microbes and they cause uh, an overgrowth, kind of like a, a canker sore in the mouth of these birds. And eventually it becomes so overgrown that it, it blocks their trachea, it blocks their esophagus. So they're unable to breathe, they're unable, unable to eat. So we always wanna make sure that we're swabbing these crops to see if these animals have this. And then if they do, we give them something called Spartrix, um, which then gets rid of it. It's, a, it's about a week long course of treatment. And then we'll do a crop swab again, just to make sure it's clear. So that's always uh, part of the intake procedure for any Cooper's hawks, morning doves, um, fish crows also sometimes get it. So it depends on the species, but they'll be getting crop swabs. And then dehydration, uh, like I said, most things do come in dehydrated. So they might get uh, two to three boluses of fluids within a day. 
Um, it's subcutaneous, so it's absorbed very, very quickly. Um, and for the first two to three days of um, admittance, they usually are getting at least um, one round of subcutaneous fluids a day. And they're also gonna get an entire full body exam. So here on the left, you can see them, uh, the clinic staff is testing the wings, making sure it has full extension. It looks as if she's holding the shoulder to make sure there's no popping. So you wanna look for dislocations, any fractures, any swelling. Uh, swelling could reveal some trauma that you might not really be able to feel otherwise. Sometimes a bone may be fractured, but it's so swollen that you can't even feel the, that it's broken. Um, so that's why we'll also be giving x-rays. You can see here, uh, you can see actually the swelling of that wing in the x-ray. The left wing has that sort of uh, like opaque area that the right wing does not. Um, and then they're also gonna get an eye exam. If they have head trauma, they're gonna get their eyes stained. So we use a special uh, like fluorescent stain to see if there's any ulcers or abrasions on their cornea. So their entire body gets looked at from head to talon. So then beyond that, depending on what our findings are, there's lots of different treatments for the different ailments that things might come in with. So this is an Osprey that we got earlier this year. You can see in this uh, x-ray on the left that it has a fractured ulna, no, fractured radius, fractured radius. Um, and it also, it's kind of hard to see, but on his body, it has a, uh, a bullet as well. So unfortunately, this bird was shot with two bullets. Um, thankfully, somebody brought it in almost right after it happened. The wounds were very, very fresh. Um, so what we did here is the, um, the bone was very well aligned. So what we did is a, it's called a figure eight wrap and that um, stabilizes the radius and ulna and it stabilizes it to its humerus like that. Um, and also, so birds, birds have kind of the same anatomy as we do, just different lengths. So it's kind of like having your hand attached to this, which is attached to this. So it can't move, it's really stable. And then slowly that bone will start to, to make a callus and then heal. So we do figure eight wraps. We also, um, if the break is too severe or for some reason the figure eight wrap is not allowing that bone to heal, you can see in the middle here, um, we can pin bones as well. So we actually put a, a sturdy metal rod in the bone. Bird bones are hollow. It's one of the adaptations that allows them to fly. It really decreases the weight since their bones are hollow, filled with air. So uh, just place, place a pin um, to stabilize those two pieces. And then after about two or three weeks, the pin is removed and that, that usually turns out very well. Um, you can see the squirrel on the right. Sometimes all they need is a little cast like a human. So he also had a fractured arm. Um, so we wrapped it up with padding really tight. And then um, that's called vet wrap on top of it. It's kind of like a, a tacky bandage. And he was released. He turned out okay. Um, and then this is a fish crow on the left that we currently have in care. And this crow came in with two fractured legs. So with a fracture, you always want to stabilize above the, stabilize the joint above and below the fracture. So here he has um, both, they're called hawks. They're the H-O-C-K-S. Uh, it's the bird equivalent of your knee. Um, so he has what we call hockey splint um, bandages on. So it's, it's making sure that that hawk is sitting like this. And then there's tape in the middle to prevent the legs from splaying out or splaying in so that hopefully they'll heal in the correct direction and the correct way. So rodenticide poisoning is another uh, cause of admission that we get. You can see this hawk here came in. Uh, the telltale sign for rodenticide poisoning is incredibly dehydrated. So their mucous membranes are gonna be very tacky. Their saliva is gonna be kind of stringy. They're gonna have uh, wildly inflamed eyes almost to the point where they can't open them. Um, but the number one is gonna be, uh, you do a blood test to see how quickly the blood coagulates. So what makes rodenticide so, um, so deadly is that it has anticoagulant properties. So if you test a bird's blood and it's not clotting at all within five minutes, it's a pretty good indication then that's probably rodenticide poisoning. So that just means that this bird has been out there um, and eating a mouse or a rat or anything that was eating rodenticide. And then that 
in turn affected them and poisoned them as well. So that's why we always, always encourage people to not use your denticide in their yards, to use other um, humane traps or even snap traps, things like that. Um, we also discourage glue traps because we get uh, lots and lots of animals that get caught on glue traps. Um, so rodenticide, we please don't use. Um, but our treatment for rodenticide is gonna be vitamin K. This helps to chelate the chemicals um, so that the body is able to um, remove them. And it helps to reverse that anticoagulant property that rodenticide causes. So this is uh, the same hawk, I, I believe a week later after being treated. So this is one of the kind of gory pictures. Um, oh, hang on, we're getting some questions about rodenticide. Um, so that's a great question, Dennis. He asked, how much does it cost to care for each patient? So the average cost of care per patient is $379. Um, our operating budget to run the clinic every day is over $2,500. Um, right now in care, I believe we have 115 patients. Um, so we're growing exponentially. Um, and as our quality of care increases, you know, the, our costs also increase. So that's why we're always asking, you know, for as much support uh, as, as is available to you. Um, and rodenticide, Joyce, uh, is a poison. It's rat poison. Um, so I believe it comes in liquid, um, but most of the time you buy, it's like uh, like food that's been infused with the poison so that the rats go and eat it. Um, yeah. Okay, so wound management. Lots of things that we see come in also um, just have wounds, but this could be uh, because of hooks like this pelican. So each of these pictures is one day apart. So it goes to show you how quickly these birds can heal if given the proper healing environment. So sometimes it's kind of counterintuitive um, because you actually have to debride the wound first. So you need to remove any debris, any scabs, any dirt in order to have a totally um, like open and clean surface, I guess, for, for this wound to be able to heal. So sometimes you have to, we say you make things worse before they can get better because out in the wild, something might get a wound and you know it's in the dirt it's getting rained on it's all this stuff so usually when animals come in their wounds are infected they're just full of all kinds of debris so all the way on the left you can see this is uh day one on intake after this wound has been debrided so it's pretty raw um this is the patagium of a pelican so it is um the the skin right here um between the the two wing bones um so wound management um, includes flushing, copious, copious amount of flushing with sodium chloride that helps to get bacteria out and any more debris. Um, and then we're going to keep it covered um, and put on SSD, which is silver sulfazidine cream and Manuka honey. So Manuka honey is completely natural. It's an amazing antibiotic. It's also an antiviral. It keeps things really moist. Um, so we'll slab some of that on, and then we're going to cover it with a non-adherent pad. So this is the same kind of stuff that's on your Band-Aid, because if you cover it just with gauze or some sort of, you know, tissue-like material, uh, it's going to adhere to that. And then as you take it off, you're just going to be ripping the scab off. So we always use non-adherent pads to allow the, um, the granulation, so the scab healing uh, tissue, to stay on that wound. So you can see after five days, this thing is basically closed up. Uh, it's not red and angry anymore. Um, this bird was obviously on antibiotics, pain medications, uh, and anti-inflammatories as well. So a lot of what we do is wound care, bandage changes, stuff like that. Pouch tears, unfortunately, are another, uh, another thing that we get in with the pelicans. So this pelican came in. Um, with pouch tears due to fishing hooks uh, and also had a fractured bill right on top of the the um, main uh, hole there so the way that we do this uh, this bird is being anesthetized so he's under anesthesia you can see the um like white uh white and clear tube there so he's being um i guess there's uh anesthesia being circulated so that he's asleep and not feeling this 
Um, so pelicans have a double double layered membrane on their pouch. So the first picture is the um, the stitching of the first membrane. So more of the interior membrane um, interior part, uh, and then you do the outside more of like the epidermis um, to make sure that those two layers are not going to kind of fuse together and create too much scar tissue. So you can see this is a success, a beautiful success and quite a, a nasty scar, but this pelican will just have a good story to tell. Um, you can see there is a small area that's still open. Um, pelican pouches are just, they're really tricky to heal because in order to eat or move around or anything, they're stretching it constantly. They're moving it around and stretching that tissue. So as long as the hole is smaller than a quarter, um, we deem that release, releasable. Um, and it contracts very, very quickly. Uh, the only time we're actually going to sew up pelican pouches like this is if they're massive gaping holes like this. Uh, if there's a hole that's maybe the size of a silver dollar, we're not gonna touch it. Uh, we're just gonna let it contract on its own. And that, that works incredibly well. They're healing machines, we say. Uh, so this pelican was able to be released, thankfully. So this isn't necessarily an injury, but it's the reason that a lot of our animals come in um, is being orphaned. So for baby opossums, these guys need to be tube fed when they're small four times a day. Um, and they need to be tube fed because they actually don't have a suckling instinct uh, in the pouch. So opossums are marsupials. So when they're in their mother's pouch, they actually swallow her nipple and just latch on. So they stay latched on for a couple months and just uh, the mother's milk slowly drips out and right into their stomach. So we also have to try to recreate that. Um, so we tube them a very specialized formula that we have to buy um, specifically for possums that recreates uh, their mother's formula or their mother's milk as closely as possible as far as levels of protein and fat and nutrients. Um, so we want to mimic that as closely as possible so that they develop properly and have um, the right the right stuff. And then we slowly transition them into eating uh, solid foods. So we'll do really soft stuff that's cat food and um, some soaked chow mixed in with the formula because they like the taste of the formula. That's what they're used to. So we slowly transition them to eating on their own. Um, and then they get transitioned to eating more stuff. And then maybe we'll put some fish in there. And then they very quickly realize that there's lots to eat and lots to do. Um, and then baby squirrels, same thing. They start out on formula, except these guys do have a suckling instinct. So we feed them with tiny syringes and little nipples. Um, and they are voracious eaters. They also eat up to four times a day when they're this small. And then you can see on the right, this squirrel is starting to transition as well. So since they have that suckling instinct, we have to be really careful about the size of the food that we're feeding them because they will try to suckle on things. And then that's a choking hazard. So this is a, a large, it's called a monkey biscuit. Um, it's actually for monkeys, but it conveniently has the same sort of nutrient um, panel that squirrels need as well. So that's a monkey biscuit that's been soaked in formula that this guy is starting to learn and to munch on. Hooks, another big reason why animals are being admitted. So you can see this pelican on the left has a whole bunch of swallowed hooks. He's also got an external hook on his wing. So to remove the hooks, um, never. And that's why we always tell people to bring the animals into us. Um, you might see that this pelican has a hook on its wing, take it out, let it go free. Meanwhile, it has you know half a dozen hooks in its stomach. So uh, we always, always, implore people to, to bring the animals to us. Uh, so to get the external hooks out, what we'll do is um, we'll cut the barb at the end and then back it out. If you try to just remove the fish hook, that barb is going to just cut through that tissue and cause so much more trauma than it already had. Um, and then for internal hooks, we have a couple methods. So the very first thing that we try is called pelican pursing. So you can see our amazing rehabber here in the middle, Tori. Um, is pelican pursing this juvenile pelical pelican. So we call it that because uh, it's kind of like reaching down into Mary Poppins purse. Because uh, what we would do is we actually put the pelican under anesthesia and we reach our entire arm and hand down into the stomach to manually remove the hooks. Um, so it helps to have small hands. Usually, you know, the women get, uh, 
get uh yeah they do yes um so <laughs> pelican pursing if that doesn't work we will do what's called a uh, cotton fish so you can see that's on the right there what we'll do is we'll stick um, a wad of cotton into a fish feed that to the bird and then the bird will digest the fish all's good but it can't digest the cotton so the body's trying to digest it it's getting all squished around in the stomach and then hopefully then squished around and encased with that hook the body realizes i can't digest this i want to get this out of here so the bird will regurgitate the cotton wad hopefully with the hook in it so that works about 50 percent of the time if pelican pursing doesn't work and then very infrequently maybe only five percent of the time um, we have to go in and actually do surgery so our veterinarian will um, go into the abdomen ab, abdomen um, and remove the hook uh, with surgery head trauma another big uh, big reason that things come in so this owl is also currently in care on the left so this owl is suffering from head trauma. Um, it is displaying signs of torticollis, which means that the neck is twisted uh, at that angle. We're not entirely sure why this happens, um, but it might be because, uh, well, it's because of head trauma, but it might be because of like the disruption of the, um, the balance inside the brain due to pressure. So um, Treatment for head trauma always includes uh, meloxicam. This is our go-to for almost everything. It's a mild painkiller, but it's a really great anti-inflammatory. It's basically like bird Advil. Um, so we'll give the bird Advil, um, and then we'll also do laser. So this is a uh, cool laser. Well, it's, it's cool, interesting, but also cool as in no heat laser. Um, and this helps to um, like, I guess, aggravate the, the cells, but in a good way to produce additional ATP, the cells absorb the energy from this laser and the, that then, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Makes, I don't know, it makes the cells heal. I, I wish I could explain better, but I don't, I don't know the biochemistry of it, but um, it, uh, yes, it heals things. Uh, imping. Imping is uh, also not something we do super often, but it's very interesting and important. So this is a red-shouldered hawk, I believe, that came in from the Miami landfill. Uh, and this, we believe, his feathers were singed um, due to methane. So he flew over um, the, the output of the methane gas and all of his feathers got singed. So imping is a procedure that we do um, with donor feathers. So a, a set of feathers from the same species that had unfortunately passed away, will harvest those feathers and actually transplant them onto the, um, the bird with the broken feathers. So we'll cut very, very close um, to the top of the feather shaft near the wing. And then we'll use a small rod, um, a toothpick or something like that, and some super glue and connect the old broken feather with the feather shaft of the new donor feather. So that's what we did for this guy. And you can see the before and after here. It was a crazy, crazy transformation. Um, but unfortunately, you can't release a bird with too many imped feathers. A few might be okay, but just, you know, what if, what if this bird's out there and then something happens and all these feathers fall out. Um, so this guy had to remain in care until he had a full molt. So all of his feathers naturally um, were lost and then regrown. But it's really important that we imped still because uh, you have to make sure that this bird is maintaining its physical fitness. Uh, if the bird is unable to fly for a year because it doesn't have feathers, it's gonna, um, it's gonna lose a lot of that muscle mass and it's gonna take even longer than um, for it to be able to be released because then it's gonna have to build up that mass and that balance and that ability to fly perfectly well. So that's why we imped in this, uh, in this case. And then release, the best part, the part that we all wait for. I love it. So uh, a couple of the avian requirements um, beyond just, is the patient better? Did, is the reason it came in resolved? 
um, is going to be their feather quality and their feather quantity. So this blue jay on the left came in, uh, I think, two years ago after somebody had found it in their yard. Um, and this was obviously deliberate. Um, it's a perfectly cut as if with scissors. Um, so somebody we think was trying to keep this bird as a pet because it also was found with a string tied around its leg. So obviously this bird is not gonna be able to fly. It's not gonna be able to fend for itself or evade predators. So we always need to make sure that if a bird is missing one or two feathers, that's probably okay. But if it's missing enough to the point where it's not going to be able to be that, you know, perfect, good enough is not good enough. Um, so we always have to, to really be sure um, that we're, we're releasing things that are totally good and ready to go. Meaning that here, this picture on the right is actually a different blue jay. Um, but so he has all of his feathers so his feather quantity isn't a problem but his feather quality is so the uh this bird was raised by a member of the public um unfortunately for around a month was not fed the correct diet um so it was in incredibly malnourished it had poor poor feather quality they were incredibly weak he wasn't able to fly because there was so much room between those feathers he wasn't able to get lift um, so he was in care for an extremely long time, um, and you can see what his feathers were supposed to look like. So the quality of the feathers is also really important for release. Waterproofing is another um, part of the, the feather necessity for release. So just like their keel score, birds are given a score of one to five, with five being the best. Uh, so you can see here, the, the owl would definitely be given a score of one. Uh, he's soaked through, soaked to the bone, very upset about it. Oh. Um, and then the bird on the bottom would be given a five. He looks like he's in the rain, but you can see the little beads on his wings. Um, I'm sure you've heard the expression like water off a duck's back. Uh, that's how it should be. Literally, we'll um, test the waterproofing. We have a spray bottle of water and we'll just spray them. And what we're looking for is just beads of water rolling off and that those feathers are gonna remain perfectly dry. So if birds come in and they don't have good waterproofing, um, sometimes pelicans will come in with motor oil um, from being around marinas. We will give them Dawn baths. So this removes all of the um, contaminant, any contaminant that's preventing them from being waterproof, but it will also unfortunately remove their natural waterproofing. So birds um, become waterproof because they preen themselves with um, their preening gland. It's located uh, near the base of their tail. So it secretes a natural oil that they then coat their feathers with um, and that repels the water and makes them waterproof. And that's why a lot of things that come in don't have great waterproofing is they're very weak already. So they don't really have the energy to be preening themselves properly. Uh, so sometimes we do have to, to help them along and let them preen from the start um, and waterproof those feathers back. Um, so kind of what I was talking about before with the physical fitness, um, just because a bird can fly does not mean that it is release ready. So uh, a bird needs to be able to carry out his tasks without undue fatigue. Hopefully all of us do too. Um, but birds, you know, they can't drink coffee in the morning, um, so they need to get their exercise. Uh, if a bird has been inside for a while, like that osprey from the very beginning that was shot, he didn't go outside for about two months. So at that point, he's not using those muscles. Those muscles are really deteriorating. So in order to be released, birds have to be able to fly a certain distance without exhibiting signs of exhaustion. So um, birds will be panting, They'll be really um, not wanting to fly anymore. Um, so we have to make sure based on the species, you know, a, a little owl is not going to have to fly as far as maybe a hawk. Um, but based on the species, we have to know how many laps they can fly without showing exhaustion um, until they're able to be released. Um, oh, well, I already talked about this, but here's more pictures with their feather quality. Uh, so stress and malnutrition are the two main uh, culprits for feather quality. So that's why we try to keep their stress down as much as possible and we feed them very specialized and varied diets while in care um, to make sure that they're completely nutritionally sound. So some species specific um, 
necessities for raptors. Uh, they need to have almost near perfect vision. So this is the only instance where good enough is not good enough doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, count. So we're a little more lenient in owls than we are in hawks. And this is because owls rely a lot on their sense of hearing, whereas hawks are more daytime hunters. So they're gonna need that perfect binocular vision. Um, but still, raptors that are raised in care need to always pass a three-day course of mouse school. So while in care, we'll feed them frozen rodents. But in order to be released, if it was raised in care and it wasn't taught this by its parents or doesn't necessarily have the instincts, we have to make sure that they have the ability to hunt on their own and survive in the wild. So they will go through three days where, where all they get is live prey. At the end of that three days, if they've increased in weight, it's obvious that they're able to fend for themselves and then they can be released. So any, um, any animal or any raptor that's raised in care goes through mouse school. And also any raptor that may have come in with um, an ocular injury will also have to go through this to make sure that they're able to compensate with that um, lack of vision. Songbirds also have their own requirements. Uh, so we wanna make sure that they're the proper weight you know, it's the same thing, just because something can fly uh, doesn't mean that it's it's ready to go. If a bird is very, very thin or has a very thin keel score, like I had talked about earlier, um, it's not gonna have the stamina, it's not gonna have those fat reserves if for some reason it can't find food right away. So we always wanna make sure they're proper weight for their species. Um, they have their fully formed high quality feathers, they're flying, baiting, and perching. So baiting is uh, when the birds turn super quick midair, um, and that's really important to be able to evade predators. They have to, you know, turn on a dime to make sure that they can dodge things or fly through the forest. I'm sure you've seen a bird just like dart through the woods. And like, how, how is this evading all of these branches and stuff? So you got to make sure that they're perfect in that regard. And also self-feeding. So they need to be able to recognize food as food and they need to be able to feed themselves. Possums. Um, so we have a weight criteria for possums as well. It's 400 grams. At this weight, um, they're pretty self-sufficient. They're big enough that they're not just going to be picked off by some of the raptors that we were just talking about. Um, but we also need to make sure that they have filled out and healthy fur, um, that they just look healthy. Because as cute as this big-eared kind of Dumbo opossum looks, He's incredibly, uh, it looks, he looks malnourished to me. Um, he looks very thin. Uh, it just looks developmentally delayed. So just because it reaches the weight threshold also doesn't necessarily mean that it's release ready. Uh, it needs to be a healthy individual as well. And it needs to be afraid of humans. So that is why we don't cuddle or, you know, talk to these cuties. Um, they, we need to make sure that they do not like us. Uh, because if they're approaching people, if they're not scared of people, they're probably not going to be scared of predators or cats. Um, they're going to be in neighborhoods. They're going to get hit by a car because they're hanging around. So we want to make sure that they do not like us. Uh, gray squirrels have their own weight requirement. Theirs is 200 grams. And we want to make sure that they also have healthy fur um, and the full fluffy tail. Uh, their tail is used for communication. So we want to make sure that it's... Uh, thick and healthy and when it's getting flicked around to say stay away or hi or meet with me um, that it's it's a good tail. Um, so we also want to make sure that they have proper fear of humans and then a special consideration for squirrels is malocclusion. So that means that the teeth are improperly aligned. Rodent teeth um, actually never stop growing. So they're not like our teeth. They have indeterminate growth. So they never stop growing. Um, but they will grind against each other as they eat, um, kind of like a nail file and grind them down to keep them a normal length. But if they're mal occluded and they are not aligned properly, they're not going to be able to grind them down. So eventually they'll start growing up and through their upper palate. Um, so it's really kind of not, not good, not humane for the squirrel. Um, so we always check before release to make sure that those teeth are perfectly aligned and ready to go. So if you ever find an injured animal, I know some of you um, have heard of us because you've brought us a bird. Some of you maybe have not. Um, so if you ever find an injured animal, 
write down this number and give us a call. We are nine to five, 365, always there to help you. Uh, if you send us a little description and a picture, we can help you determine if the animal even needs help at all. Sometimes things will look injured or sick or lost um, when in reality they're perfectly fine. Uh, and then if it is the case that it's injured and it needs help, we will be able to walk you through it um, and help you along. So jot down that number. So songbirds, these are probably the easiest to contain. Um, you're just gonna pick them up, gently pick them up, put them in a dark, quiet box, um, but do not give food or water. And I'll repeat that 10 times, do not give food or water. And this counts for any wild animal that you're gonna rescue. If something is super weak, um, Kiki likes to give the example of, if, if somebody just got hit by a car and they're on the way to the ambulance or they're on the way to the hospital, you're gonna say like, we need to stop at McDonald's. Like this man needs a hamburger. Like, no, you're gonna get to the hospital because he's injured and he, he can't eat right now. He might not even be able to swallow. Um, so it's, it's potentially very, very dangerous to offer any food or water if something is so weak. Uh, it's very easy for them to aspirate. So to get some of that food or that liquid into their um, lungs and then they get pneumonia. So we always ask no food, no water um, into a dark, quiet box and then as, quick, as quickly as possible into, into rehabilitation. So mammals, you're gonna wanna worry about their teeth. So always wear leather gloves oh sorry there's yes yes is on the left and no is on the right um so you can wear gardening gloves use a really heavy towel and grab them firmly from behind at the base of their skull uh, i don't know how or where this myth was perpetuated that possums can hang from their tails but they cannot please never try to pick up a possum by its tail uh, their tails are prehensile meaning that they aid in climbing, um, but they cannot hold the full weight of their body. So you can really hurt them um, if you pick them up from their tail. Seabirds, um, these guys, you're gonna want to worry about their beak. So that's their main method of defense is they're gonna try to bite you. So again, secure hold of the back of the head. Your towel is your best friend. You can always just keep an old towel in your trunk. Uh, you never know when you're gonna encounter something. Um, so your personal safety is just as important as the birds. So we don't want anybody getting bit. Um, so some garden gloves and a towel. And then raptors, uh, their method of defense is their feet. So as sharp as their beaks might be, they hardly ever try to bite you. What they're gonna do is roll onto their backs, stick their feet up and then try to talon you. So uh, if possible, you can throw a towel over the bird and then just kind of scoop it up like a football focus on grabbing the legs to make sure that the legs don't grab you, um, put them into your dark, quiet box, and then get them on over. So now you know the whole process, intake, the treatments, the release. Um, so here's a little spotlight of a recent release that we just did. This is patient 21, 990, or 977, a uh, great white heron. So somebody had uh, found this in her yard. She gave us a call. She had no idea what to do. She did not want to pick it up. Um, so you can see here, uh, she texted us at 10 o'clock. And by 1130, um, we had a staff member out there to rescue the bird. So we have a large group of volunteers. Um, if you're, for some reason, unable to get the bird or you can't transport the bird, we have an amazing group of volunteers um, that will go out and assist you, assist with transporting. Um, and if you are interested in becoming part of that um, volunteer group, you can shoot Kiki an email. Um, their group is called Operation Rescue and Release. So um, you can see that uh, this bird was able to get into care very quickly, um, thanks to the, the caring woman that found him. Um, so this bird uh, was admitted due to botulism. So botulism is a naturally occurring um, bacteria in the environment that when ingested, um, it bioaccumulates. So it kind of lives down in the muck in the detritus in the ocean and the fish eat it. And then a bigger fish eats that. And then this bird eats that fish. Um, so it accumulates quickly in the body and it essentially leads to like a mild paralysis. So this bird was unable to stand, unable to blink, unable to, to feed itself. 
So you can see here our two clinic members are force feeding fish uh, after a little bit of sub Q fluids um, and then liquid feedings, we begin to transition them to fish, which are a little more nutritionally dense um, and their bodies are used to it because that's what they're eating in the wild. So I believe he was in inside for about a week. And then he was moved outside uh, to our outdoor enclosures. Once he was able to stand, he started to eat on his own, started to fly. Um, and since he was down for a little bit, we had to make sure that he had enough time flying because just because he can fly doesn't mean he's ready. Uh, so we made sure that he had all that stamina. He was able to, to eat his own food and gain weight. And then he was released. It was a beautiful, beautiful release. He was released um, back to where he was found. He actually had a mate at the Crandon Marina. And the next day uh, we had someone send us a picture of uh, a great white heron that they saw right in the area. So we're pretty sure it was this guy, which always makes us happy. So that's him flying away into the distance. And this is what all makes it worth it, you know, that somebody had found this bird in their yard and then from there the fact that we were able to to give it a second chance at life um, is so rewarding and that's that's why we're here that's why we've been here for 41 years um so how you guys can help i'm sure you're all wondering uh so you can volunteer kiki is the volunteer coordinator so if you're interested in operation rescue or a volunteering act the station with the animals. Um, you can go to pelicanharbor.org slash volunteer. Um, I'm not sure actually if we still have a waiting list. We did for COVID. Um, yes, we actually do. Uh, and then I check it often and start once I speak to the volunteers, I send them an application to our logistics. It just keeps it a lot cleaner and more organized. Uh, and you can donate as well. Um, somebody had asked earlier how much uh, the cost of care is and each patient um, it turns out to be over $300 per patient um, for cost of care. So this can be a financial contribution, um, can be uh, a trust or a foundation. Um, you can donate from your IRA. There's so many different ways to help um, and every dollar makes a difference. It truly does, you know. Um, so you can learn more at our website as well. And the educate and advocate. So tell people about us, share our posts, um, become more engaged in the community and let people know about who we are and the conservation efforts that we're doing within Miami. And you can also adopt an ambassador animal. So our, our goal is obviously to rehabilitate and release. There are some that have suffered uh, permanent injuries so we have a group of 15 elite animal ambassadors um, that you can ceremoniously adopt. Um, so we have a Virginia possum, we have some pelicans and owls. So that makes a good gift too. Um, and then follow us on social media for updates, cute pictures, events. We are hosting lots of events now that um, the world is finally opening up. So you can always keep updated with what we're up to uh, on our socials. And does anybody have any questions? Okay, good, good. Thanks, Fanny. Anna, that was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, <laughs> at any rate, um, I just wanted to thank you. I, I joined late, but um, every single time I join one of these, I learn so much. So thank you so much. It was incredibly informative Hannah good Terrific. class and I just I encourage I'm a volunteer there so I encourage there seems like we have a really nice um number of people attending today so I encourage you all to uh to really spread the word because um I don't know if you're like me but oftentimes I'm on the next door sites and um we we I see it coming through all the time. Found it, found a little bird. Found it. You know what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And you know so we we always have more work to do in terms of letting everyone know that we exist, and um, uh, and also educating as to how to take care of an animal. Be, you know before they're actually brought to the station. So thanks, Joanne. We love you. <laughs> Um, why is it called a Virginia possum? 
Do you know? I don't. That's a very good question. I'm going to have to look that up. Because <laughs> I've brought you baby possums in, in uh, they're not from Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. There's some things that are just like the, the northern mockingbird, even though it's in Florida, too. So I don't, I'm not sure. Also, you're moving to a new place. I, uh, we are. That. Yes. And yes. So. How, how is it going? It's going great. Um, for those that don't know, we purchased a two and a half acre property on the Little River where we are expanding um, to a site 14 times our current size. I'm not sure if everyone's had the chance to visit our current facility, but we have clearly outgrown it if you have. Um, so we're hoping to break ground next fall. I'm very, very excited about that. Uh, we're gonna build a massive hospital, education center, uh, manatee viewing. Uh, it's a Tecasta Indian site. So it's gonna be super diverse. Um, we're so, so excited about that. Do you have an expect, you know, expected date you'll be there? Um, I don't. I think it, the date is to completion is optimistically two and a half to three years. Gotcha. While on the while on the tour uh, in the uh, the boat, um, we gave a donation. He told us about it, and and we gladly gave you guys a donation. So. Thank you so, so much. We can't do it without our community, so. Exactly, why not? Thank you. And I honestly believe that this organization, we all don't need extra stuff, you know? So maybe some people can donate for your birthday. You can start a Facebook fundraiser, or you can ask for donations to the Seabird Station. I have had the fortune of working for many great nonprofits in Miami-Dade County, Citizens for Better South Florida, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden, and few have the integrity and the passion that Pelican Harbor Seabird Station has. Uh, when you're able to find an injured animal, and I often say that we get calls from Fisher Island, Liberty City, uh, La Pequeña Habana, and you hear the quiver in people's voice when they find an injured animal and they wanna help. And they are, they become part of the rescue team. Sometimes when we, that person cannot bring them in, we call Uber or Lyft. And then that person becomes part of the rescue team and they get dropped off and they get intake in. And our volunteers are, to me, our volunteers are so amazing because unlike at Fairchild, where they're work, walking through a rainforest full of mist and orchids and butterflies, our volunteers are cleaning bird poop and cutting bird pieces, you know, fish to feed to the birds, you know, without getting to pet them as they would at the Humane Society. But then we give these animals, you know, a second chance. So the organization and passion that Pelican Harbor Seabird has is uncomparable. And I encourage all of you to either, you know, become part of Operation Rescue and Release, become a monthly donor, even a five or a $10 donation makes an incredible difference. And it's an organization with integrity with how none of us are driving Lexuses, you <laughs> know, uh, but how the funds are managed and how the staff and animals are treated. And I hope you're enjoying these. These started primarily to give our volunteers more knowledge, but we wanted to invite our community to come and participate and see what happens behind our doors. Because as a staff member, I'm always so curious at seeing, you know, what's the clinic doing? You know, how do they know? Imagine when you get sick, you can tell your doctor what's going on. When your cat or dog gets sick, you kind of can tell the vet because you saw it. But here an animal is found on the street and is brought in and the incredible rehab staff have to just pull things together and work their magic as they did with the great white heron or these baby possums or birds that are stuck to glue traps. It's incredible. We love you all. You guys are amazing. Hannah, big round of applause thank to you. 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 Thank you. You were incredible as always. Stephanie, thank you for being great at bringing everyone in, making sure the IT works, because I sure don't know how to. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my doggy is saying hello. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, so if you do want to volunteer, kiki at pelicanharbor.org. And maybe we can get Joanne to give you a training because she is <laughs> amazing at it. And we are starting, like I said, 
the seabird cruises are on. We're starting guiding tours. And if you have a kid that goes to school tell, or summer camp, we can do a Zoom presentation, you know, and introduce our ambassador animals to them. So the, our education is unlimited. So thank you, friends. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.